uh, we have uh, two sessions, uh, one now and the next one right after uh, after the tea break, same menu. And uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give a quick background on what we are trying to do here and why we are having this session. And then we'll go into some discussions. First one will be, uh, the for the first session, it will be led by Taurit. And the second one will be led by, Taurit is looking at me, I know why. And uh, the second one will be Basuki. Uh, so uh, according to Taurit, I'm supposed to lead both the sessions. That is why he is a bit concerned. But <clears throat> uh, giving that aside, so the idea, uh, idea why we wanted to have a session of this nature is uh, we wanted to discuss the challenges and the opportunities as uh, emerging entrants we are facing and how uh, those challenges we can uh, and also make use of the opportunities to come together. Uh, I hope you all were there in yesterday's uh, the plenary uh, keynote and Rene uh, was talking about a similar topic, be together, better together. So that's also an idea how that we can come together, smaller emerging entrants and uh, work together uh, to a better future. That's the idea. And <clears throat> I take uh, this session as, uh, or the emerging entrant topic as we started in uh, Nepal, uh, although we didn't call it an emerging entrant session, Taurit arranged an uh, overwhelming uh, group of people. With our, we, we couldn't even find space in the room to put enough. Maybe the title we put is wrong, Taurit, this time. We don't have any. Your title was better. We had a lot of people. And, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, what we discussed there is just an example. We started with an example project, a project we all uh, together did or doing. And the benefits we saw in a project where a few of us, a few different interns together, uh, come together and uh, what we did. So uh, building upon that, uh, what we are do trying to do uh, today is see how uh, we can make it a little more formal not very formal, a little more formal for now uh, on how we all can come together and work towards a common goal uh, for the region, for all of us together. Uh, that's the idea. And uh, to do that, uh, in APAN 56, our idea is to take a look at a status. So in APAN 56, we are not going to discuss a lot about how the future will be, although that will be in our back of our heads and mind. However, uh, we'll be mostly looking at a status, status of, of where we are, how we measure our status, uh, what do we think is a good uh, model out of all how we all are operate, uh, how do we think we can work together, uh, present status, right? So at the present status. So that's the uh, basic idea. So we are uh, mostly discussing about uh, present status and uh, in both the session that is like first one and also the second one uh, we are just discussing about the present status and uh, uh, we'll take notes we'll take notes for way forward uh, so that that can be discussed in the upcoming APAN meeting so we are planning on continuing this and uh, the next meeting we'll be mostly discussing about the future and how we can take it forward what are the strategies that we can come out uh, in fact, uh, Rene was, I think his key were like point was have a strategy for all of us. So, uh, uh, so today's sessions, we will be having that in mind, what sort of strategies we can start working on, but we'll not have time to discuss strategies today, I believe, because we don't have enough time. First, first we have to understand where we are. So the status first, and then strategies later. Uh, we'll, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, we'll mostly focus on strategies, how we can formulate them in the in the later uh, sessions to come. So that's uh, said, and I'll uh, ask Taurit to start the first session. I don't think I had introduced Taurit, but just in case, uh, Mohamed Taurit is from BDRN. Uh, he's currently leading BDRN, uh, the CEO of BDRN, and uh, 
very well known in the community. Taurit, over to you. Okay. So a very good morning to everybody. Actually, I was looking for a full house. It is not there. At least some Appan people is there to fill the house. So thank you, Liana. <laughs> Keep on your work. So, all, the important all the important people, yes. Uh, if if I knew that, I could have more panelists because once you can gather the speakers, then you can have the audience. So that is another beauty or another strategy. Uh, actually, we were looking for designing it in a presentation mode. But Roshan told me that actually presentation, it feels a little bit boring. It is almost one-sided. It doesn't work. It doesn't have any impact. So that's why I tried to make it in a panel discussion session. So the modality will be, someone will be the lead panelist. He will trigger the discussion and then rest of the panelists will follow. Actually, even if we can get some inputs from the audience, that will be also welcome. It is our goal to build a sustainability model. As you all know, that each and every NREN, forget about emerging NREN, even the NRENs from developed countries, they are hankering after sustainability. Nobody can claim that they are sustainable. And each and every country is a different country. It's a different context. It's a different environment. And no particular strategy will work for each and every country. But having said so, we can think about some basic commonalities so that we can move on. At least we have to start. So back in 2018, when I actively involved with APAN, so I am very nascent here, then I was actually confused by looking at the big networks. So they were introducing 10G, 100G. So I was confused where I am. Because at that time, we had only 45 megabit connectivity with Mumbai. We started with that in 2018. But then I understood that, okay, that is a different chapter. That is the story of all the developed countries. They are looking for connectivities. They are hankering after bandwidth. They are hankering after speed. But my goal is different. As Rene mentioned, the other day, yesterday, that your goal is to satisfy your members, satisfy your clients, what they want. If they are satisfied, then you are safe. Doesn't matter you have 100G connectivity or 200G connectivity, you have resilient ring, you have redundancy, you have backup, all those things doesn't matter. So I started from that point, and after five years, at least I can say that I am somewhere, okay? I am not amazed by the high capacity links because once upon a time, I thought that what and what, a, what is a signature parameter for an engine. So I used to think that the Global Research and Education Network Connectivity is the signature parameter. But now I doubt that, at least for the developing countries. Yes, there are other panelists, they can view it. When I go to my member institute, I never mention that we have one GBPS connectivity with the Research and Education Network. Because I know if they ask the next question, I cannot answer. What shall I do with that connectivity? I don't have any answer. That's why I address the problems differently. I try to find out what they're looking for. 
and I try to address their needs. So that should be the goal for each and every NREN. So let's try to identify what are the needs of our members and how we can make our NREN sustainable. So first and foremost, I will start with the NREN structure. That is the basis of sustainability, what I think, because this structure has made BDRM sustainable. I can claim that. Without the, this structure, actually BDRM couldn't establish its footprint in the industry. So if I go by the types of structure, it can have independent structure with beneficiaries being owners. It can have a structure under government control and sponsorship, or it can have any other formation. I drafted two compendiums for Asia Connect, one in 2018 and one in 2020. And also we did combinedly, we and LEARN did the NREN need assessment study. But after doing so many works, I don't have the database when I try to, when I tried to put it down in a formal structure, then I don't know about the structure other than BDN and other than LEARN. So that's why I thought that it could be a starting point if all NRENs participate, at least we shall have the database of the structure of each and every NREN. So I think you will come forward with the help. Let me give you a glimpse about the BDN Board of Trustees, BDN runs under, under an 11 member Board of Trustees led by the Chairman of University Grants Commission. It is important, that's why I'm mentioning it. It is important for everybody because University Grants Commission of Bangladesh, they allocate the budget for each and every member. So once he becomes the top of our structure, when he sits on the top of our structure, the allocation of budget and the spending of budget is under his control, under his supervision. So it gives us an extra mileage. The vice chairperson, he is also a member of University Grants Commission. Then there are trustee member from six, six vice chancellors from four, four from public universities and two from private universities. There is one additional secretary, he is from the ministry two distinguished personalities as inducted trustee. Normally, we take it from the academicians list, but sometimes we take it from the industry also. And me as secretarial support. So if you look at the structure, you can see that the structure is mostly dominated by the people who allocate the budget, and by the people who spend the budget. So that is the beauty of this structure. If I go by its strengths, I have already mentioned the strength lies in the structure, the ownership, because the users, the universities, they are our main users, they are our main contributors. So they are the owners, they are at the, sitting at the top of BDRN. So the belongingness is there and it's a government-owned trust. The beauty is we can utilize 
that it's a government trust because for some of the cases we need that. I don't know how the procurement works in your country. In our country, if you are a government owned company, then you can manage direct procurement orders from the members and from the clients or from anybody. If they procure through BDRAN, they don't need to go for official tendering process. So they can skip that. So that is the beauty. So we do a lot of projects and we make a good margin out of that. Suppose a university, they want to build a campus network. So they will come directly to us. Okay, build us a campus network. Can you do that? Yes, we can do that. Okay, how much will be the budget? So we do the surveying. We provide the consultancy. We procure the equipment. We install the equipment and we make a healthy profit. We keep a healthy profit margin. So that is one side of the income. So at that time, we are government-owned trust. But normally, government means bureaucracy. It means procrastination, delay. But for any of the decision, we don't need to go to the government. We don't need to go to the ministry. This 11 member body, this 11 member body, they are authorized to give any decision. So the trust is in their hand, the allocation of money and everything. There is no government audit. If there would have been a government audit, I have told my board, board of trustees, that when the government audit will start in Bediran, I will resign. Because the way I spend, I cannot manage government audit. It's impossible. Okay? They will go for every nuances and I have to show the compliance. It is not possible. So I only use the government signature, only I need that. Otherwise, I don't use that. Even in my visiting card, I don't put any government signature. As I mentioned, it is an independent body in making decision. So it expedites decision making. Earning revenue is a challenge instilled into each and every employee. It increases dynamism because my staff, they are not government employees. They cannot claim that they are government employees. So I can recruit, I can hire, and I can fire by myself. For some of the positions, I need to go to my board, but normally I can hire and fire by myself. So no job is secured, no job is insecure if you follow the rules and if you can show your belongingness and your ownership. So that is the beauty of this structure also. As I already mentioned, UGC and Bediran, though different entity, they have the same person at the highest echelon and that promote Bediran services. And the beauty of this structure is, I could offer a separate salary structure, which is way different than government salary. So it almost 2.5 times of normal government salary.
basically has outsourced its services, operation services to the vendors. For example, this pan, this whole knock is sitting there. It is, has been outsourced, completely outsourced to some a vendor and it is operating by the vendor and it is controlling and all the other initiatives if you can ask the development also uh, sorry automation also or the smart university projects also whatever it is under the fund mostly operations activities goes to the vendor side because of the fact is that the employees are not getting the match salaries or much pay to handle this all the operational activities or has a a very uh, technical expertise is if, if some employees have a technical expertise, they now sit here in the firm because they cannot afford that uh, salary of, mm -hmm. of that employee. So uh, as far as the approving authority is concerned, it is simply the chairman HSC has, or, or, or we call it the executive director, has uh, authority to approve anything which is belongs to firm. So. Uh, I would say that PAN is is having a structure is completely different from the BD9 or Nepal. It's 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 uh, uh PAN is basically is now a department of a higher education commission, which is providing the end end services to the universities of Pakistan. Okay, now if I dig down a bit, although it will be covered under financing model. But I just want to understand how the budget is allocated. Yeah, uh, I have my uh, account manager also. The, the budget basically is uh, HEC, the finance department is is a, uh, is a one of the department like IT or something like that. It builds the budget for every every uh, uh, I mean every departments. For example, IT slash pun. So PAN is, is they allocate uh, separate budgets for PAN. Uh, and, and it, it goes like, for example, they, they, uh, they ask PAN that how much budget they will require for the recurring activities. This is the recurring activity, how much they require. So as per the demand, they uh, fight with the government to allocate that budget. Now, government sees that budget as uh, not sees as a budget allocated to fund. It sees a budget total allocated to HEC. Fortunately, the government is expanding on HEC uh, a very handsome amount. So uh, whatever we ask is is basically uh, 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 is is basically somewhere or other gets approved. But yes, there is some. Uh, we will come to uh, I, I think the uh, next part with how. The financing model goes that how much shares the university contributes and the HEC contributes, but the fact is, uh, the finance department gets the budget of HEC, and within that, the PAN budget is also get in uh, demanded from the government of Pakistan. And for the development budget, if some development activities, we build a PC one separately. Uh, this is called the development document. We build a separately. And puns, uh, I mean, they defense the budget to a, a, a very uh, a recognized committee of government of Pakistan, we call it CDWP. Uh, and after that, the budget gets approved for any development activity that we are doing. Okay. It is probably the same as in Bangladesh. But my question is, when you collect the revenue, where it goes? To government exchequer? or to IT department of PAN? It is going to the government. It Go is going government to, it comes to HEC and it is utilized by the HEC. It comes to HEC. HEC. And HEC is authorized to spend any money that comes under HEC. Yes, HEC okay. is authorized to spend. OK. So do you have any pressure about earning revenue like do the does the finance department charge you that okay you told us that you will get one million dollar from the revenue from the universities and i will allocate two million dollar for you so that's three million is your budget now there is 0.5 million only has been collected from your members 
So I have to spend 2.5 million. So do you have any such pressure? A lot of pressure. I believe mm -hmm. uh, uh, from last five years, uh, when our, uh, mm, our, uh, we are using the hybrid model of 50-50, I mean 50% from the government grant, 50% from the universities. And uh, due to this fight and this uh, this observations by the government, by the uh, HEC department and the government, we need to, we have, uh, sorry, we have increased the budgetary of the universities, of the earning from the universities. So right now, the universities are only contributing, I think, 4.5% of the total revenue and nine. Uh, Government is contributing 5% of the total revenue and 95% has been earned or re uh, recovered from the universities. So due to this pressure, because of the fact is that we launched some of the projects that required some recoveries and all that, and it was always a fight between the, the uh, end of the financial years that you have to recover this amount of money and you didn't recover this amount of money, you have to and uh, and we have, we have, do not have this money to provide you further. So the, for, due to this debate, we need have to increase the recovery amount of the universities. Now, obviously, universities are, are in the in not in not a good mood to provide us such funding. But we have to increase the budgeting of the universities so that we have to minimize the demand from the government of Pakistan. Okay. So although it is run like a government organization model, the revenue earning challenges are still there. Obviously. Obviously. Okay. So. Hi, uh, this is Karma from uh, Druk Research and Education in Pakistan. Uh, so what we have, the structure we have in uh, Bhutan uh, with regard to the operation and management uh, of Druk Research and Education Network, is different from what uh, Nepal has, what Pakistan has, and also what uh, BTRN has. Uh, some points, some some of the design principles are similar to what Pern has mentioned, because we also started uh, as the as the project. Uh, so it was it was started as a national project in twenty fourteen uh, to provide uh, high speed uh, access to the higher education institutions, the colleges under Royal University of Bhutan. And back then when we started, we identified only uh, nine colleges, nine uh, colleges under Royal University of Bhutan. And the, the key focus of the project was to establish this high-speed network, dedicated high-speed network. Uh, and Uh, procurement rules and regulations, HR policies as such. Uh, now, before we started this project, we of course had lots of consultations with the uh, community, with our potential members, uh, education, and we were actually pushing for uh, a model where the National Research and Education Network is operated and managed by the community. So that's what we were pushing for. Uh, but unfortunately, there was no takers. Uh, we went to the Royal University of Bhutan. Uh, we went to the Ministry of Education. We went to uh, Ministry of Health. 
uh, because the hospitals would also end up connecting to uh, the research and education network. And we went to other NGOs in Bhutan and we were basically pitching the idea so there would be someone who can operate and manage and take up the uh, operation of the Drug Research and Education Network. Unfortunately, we couldn't find one. And uh, at last, it made sense for my agency to take up and build this uh, network. Because uh, most of the members that we connect to are financed by the government. So like, for example, schools, the uh, the universities are, are all public institutions and they are financed by the government, right? So, so they get the budget from the government. Uh, so it did not make sense for them to no, for for us to charge them also, at a, uh, we needed nominal uh, membership fees, which we still collect, but it didn't make sense for us to charge high, very high membership fees so that we can sustain on our own. Uh, so what we did was we convinced the government, this is how it's working, and uh, they supported us. And most of the operation fees, uh, the budget comes from the government. So we sustain on the government budget. And there is a commitment from the government to support this. Yeah. So in your case, there is no pressure from government that, okay, you have to be a sustainable, independent organization. No, right? we, we don't have any okay. pressure. So government. your situation is more comfortable than wh what other people are standing. Yes. Okay? Uh, so, yeah. Because of the context in the in my country, the environment, I think, like you rightly pointed out, there is uh, uh, no single shoe that fits all, right? Mm -hmm. One shoe that fits all. So it was uh, different for us because we had a different reality. So we had to pay, play a different ball game. Uh, but do you fi find any weakness in such a structure? Yes, there are a few challenges. There are a few challenges. Uh, like I pointed out earlier, we have to adopt the the government procurement rules and regulation, the government HR policies. Uh, so, uh, so it delays certain uh, when we want to implement and upgrade our routers, uh, upgrade our infrastructure. There will be some delays because we have to follow the nominal uh, normal document rules and regulations. Uh, but at the same time, if you see, when we started, we had only five uh, people operating and managing the Drukran. And I was leading a team and I executed the project. But now we have uh, uh, gotten approval from the government to uh, increase our HR strength from five to 120. So, so uh, this has recently come. And uh, we have already restructured and we now have about uh, 90 employees, 90 employees from five. Uh, and uh, from 90, we have about 75 or regular uh, uh, and about uh, 15 on contract. Uh, that so is a have, big development. Yes. So I didn't know that. Uh, currently filled up about 75%. Uh, of 120. Uh, so it has happened very recently. Yes, yes? Uh, because of the recent transformation exercise that is going on. Uh, we pitched uh, our issues, challenges. Uh, we took it up to our agency head and to the uh, uh, the civil service uh, uh, office who recruits, who approves the recruitment of the uh, civil servants. So we convince them and this so is the reality. any challenge like Parn was mentioning that there is high turnover rate. So is yep. there any challenge to keep competent employees? Yes, under very much, disposal? very much. So once we train them, once we train them, once we upskill them, uh, there's always uh, opportunities. Uh, not only within the country, in the private sector, but also outside. Because uh, the salary structure of yes. government and private yes, is obviously yes, yes, different. Yes. So we have the attrition uh, for the civil service right now stands at 16%. Uh, it has drastically increased over the years. Uh, this is something that we haven't faced earlier. 
now which we are facing but also at the same time there are some interventions coming from the royal government of Bhutan recently the uh, salary of the, all the civil servants were revised it was increased by 55 to uh, 60 percent of okay. the total basic pay uh, but still then uh, I think uh, when there are greener pasture uh, when they are offered higher salary I think this is something inevitable we lose them, but what we're trying to do is to build an ecosystem to retain the uh, the engineers, train them, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, the attrition is going to, will fall. Yeah, so the fund is allocated by the, the Ministry of Finance. So it is the government uh, extra uh, revenue. Uh, the budget comes from the government. So we every year we plan, we submit a budget proposal for the operation and maintenance, for the upgrade, for the new links, for the restoration, for OAM of the links. So we come up with the plan every year and submit to the government and the government approves every year. Uh, Yes, we get uh, we are audited, and what we do is we come up with the one uh, plan uh, that is the five year plan. So the five year plan we uh, put all the budget that that would be required in the next five years, and then from that five years budget, then we ask the annual budget from the uh, the five year budget. So they are actually a truly government organization. Yes. So yes. there is less challenges in terms of finance, in terms of financial challenges. The challenge is not that much other than doing some development activities. Yes. Operational uh, finance is managed by their operational budget, but probably they have other challenges. Yes. But not in the financial sector. Financially, they are highly stable. Right, Karma? Yes, true, true. But we also charge nominal fees. We collect nominal fees as a annual membership fees from our members. Uh, we collect uh, based on the uh, the bandwidth they subscribe to Drukran. So, for example, if they subscribe for 100 uh, megabit per second, we charge them about uh, 300 US dollars every year. Uh, and if they subscribe to one gigabit per second, we charge about 500 to 600 US dollars every year per member. So this is the annual membership fees that we collect, uh, but it does not cover our operation costs at all. That comes into membership fees, right? Yes, yes. That comes okay, we will come to that point later. Sorry. Oh yeah, for the membership fees. So uh, for the membership, three hundred US dollars, three hundred, three hundred per year, uh, per member, for hundred meg megabit per second, hundred megabit MBPS. per second. Yes, hundred Mbps for one Gbps is about five hundred fifty US dollars. It is nothing per year per member. Yeah. It's very it is actually nothing. It's very nominal. It is much lower than your cost of bandwidth. Yes, but the cost gets uh, the the budget gets filled by the government. Uh, so we can operate and manage the network. Asita, about land structure. I was saying something wrong. So, uh, so uh, land structure is actually uh, it's a um, we call a, a public li a limited liability company. Uh, which was, you know, as established as that in 2009. Uh, before that, it was just a, a project and then established as a limited liability company, uh, which is owned by the the state universities and the University Grants Commission. So they are the um, the members of, um, of LEARN uh, and they are represented uh, in the board of directors, um, which... Uh, basically takes all the policy decisions and the chairman of learn is the, the vice chairman of 
UGC who was present uh, yesterday in the opening ceremony. Um, so, uh, so the board of directors uh, take the policy decisions, and then uh, as a company, we have the 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 CEO, CTO, and the other um, employees um, who are not specifically in the government structure. So the whole idea is that we can um, recruit people as we want and do things um, freely um, and uh, give the you know kind of match the industry salaries. Um, so it depends on on the policy decisions, policy decisions that are taken by the by the the board of uh, the directors um, who are government or like you know university employees. So um, there's always. Uh, uh, you know, a struggle sometimes uh, to convince people uh, because um, uh, as of now in Sri Lanka with the, all the financial problems and all that, um, we are seeing a lot of new rules and circulars and everything. So people are afraid to make changes, but we have had good times and, and now it's kind of, but still we had a, a, a big uh, salary revision really recently because uh, as mentioned due to the inflation, uh, inflation and everything uh, the salary structures were changed heavily so in the industry in the it industry specifically um, the salaries are mostly pegged to dollars and euros and australian dollars and so on so the, their salaries are actually like in the last uh, year in a year and a half the salaries in Sri Lanka uh, have doubled, more than doubled for in the IT industry because of the the you know, the uh, the rupee crash, right? So uh, so it's very it was very hard for us to match that. So now we have we have had a, a salary revision with uh, the and uh, it's now looking good. So we have to see how it goes. Um, but we have the we have the uh, the free them to actually operate by ourselves um and looking at the financial structure uh, we don't get any money from the government uh we solely run from uh, the revenue that is earned uh from the from providing uh, the services to the universities um and and when you say that you know basically what we are um, um, doing is uh, using the economy of scale and then the bargaining power uh, to uh, uh, the buy the get the services at a low cost and give that uh, to the universities uh, to our members. Um, so even though the controlling members are, we have seventeen state universities, but we are providing more than to more more than sixty institutes. Um, and on top of that, of course, we are providing the other services as well. Uh, but still, you know, we are making. Uh, I mean that is uh, has been a sustainable model so far, but now there's again uh, a, a few challenges, especially because the government is not giving money money to okay, the universities will, as well. I will come to that financial model later. Yeah. So now let us keep ourselves within the structure. Yeah. So if I put Bidiran and Learn side by side. It is almost similar structure, right? Is mm -hmm. there any difference? Uh, you yeah, can point out. Uh, the difference out. is like it, it's it's not a government owned trust. I mean, it, it is there's no trust, uh, and so it's like you no, know, the government doesn't really have a, a control over. Uh, yeah, same same with Bidiran. So all the decision making capability is there with the board of trustees, yeah. and in your case, the board, board of, of directors, yes. right? So it is almost similar. The revenue yeah. that you earn, it remains within your company. Yeah. And in your case, it's a company. Yes. In our case, it's a non-profitable trust. Yeah. It's, it's, it's non 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 non-profit company, basically. So we are not, it's not a profit-taking so company. I'm no trying to visualize that where from the bidder and trust concept came. Actually, I used to think that it is from Pakistan. Because Vidiran has been developed very recently. So I think it is the Sri Lankan concept which has been instilled into our policymakers' mind. We call it a company limited by guarantee. 
as it is a non profit profitable company yeah okay anything else okay to i will come to the financial model later i'm moving very slow so should i move faster or should i take comments from Well, from a total different part of the world, but I see some of the same issues is interesting to see because everybody started as a project. Uh, if I look at the five engines that I had at Norton in that sense, one of them is a competitive limited by guarantee, and that's the most successful one. Uh, Who is that? That is CSC in Finland. Oh, Finland. Oh. Uh, they are extremely efficient, <clears throat> and they are very good at what they're doing. They're very basically run. <laughs> as a private company. In uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, there are government organizations and they have all been restructured at least three times. And every time they're, they're being restructured, they go in hibernation for two years. Uh, Nordunet as a collaborative organization was set up as a company limited by guarantees. And the statutes were written of a very wise person in the Danish ministry, and that has been extremely helpful later on, because every time one of the governments uh, decided we want to do something else, we had our shareholder agreement, which basically says, well, you can't. Uh, and that has been extremely helpful in terms of keeping a long-term relationship. There's a couple of other things into this. <clears throat> um, the attrition of staff is detrimental to most organizations. Um, by being a more privately limited type company uh, that is guaranteed by the state, <clears throat> you have the ability to offer medium, median ranges uh, salaries, which means that people have a tendency not to move from you. Despite they're not being paid top dollar, they're also not being paid bottom dollar. So that has really kept Nordinet had an <clears throat> and it was actually hard to get rid of people at some point in time because people are so satisfied being there. The other things depend on what you want to do <clears throat> in terms of services and especially if you start looking into dealing with telecommunication companies on international then having a structure that allows you to do long-term contracts I don't know how long-term your contracts are, but typically what I've seen for many NRINs that they do 24 to 36 months contracts for um, connectivity because of their product cycles. That's the most expensive way of doing telecommunication. Um, when we did, uh, I mentioned that a bit yesterday, when we went away from that for the first Connecting Europe to Asia link, went to a 20-year deal, the price dropped to 1 16th. It, for, for a 10 gigabit link for Nordinet, it went from nearly 300k euros per year to 16k euros per year. But that also requires that your organization can do the long-term commitments. So that is some of the advantages you need to look at. What do you intend to do with the organization, both in country and if you're thinking of working together? Um, and then build the structure from that. But if you're going to make a shareholder agreement, I'm happy to share Nortonet because that's the best piece of work I've seen for a very long period of time because it really was the founding fathers who put that one in and looking ahead, how do we bind people not doing stupid decisions many years from now? Uh, and as I said, many of the other government organizations has been restructured so many times and it's really been detrimental and not very efficient doing that. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay.
only one is government rest four are only one is private right rest four are government one is private uh, one is part of the research agency which is horrible uh, one is part uh, of the special case set of which uh, owned by the university and makes species basically they the guy they get decisions and the last one is a company but owned by the state and uh, i think they've been restocked up three times in five years because every time a new state secretary gets a new idea things change uh, yeah that is not healthy if you want to do long-term commitments in terms of services or development where you want to do long-term commitments in terms of telecommunication you need a state response mm -hmm. Yes, yes uh, I, I think this is uh, in my uh, uh, I'm in Basuki from Indonesia. This is uh, we have a problem, the same problem, changing the government structure, and then government didn't come, didn't give us money, and then yeah, we have to find the other way. One of the things that we try several years ago that we want to have like a long term contract with the telco, some telco or some cable company. With maybe like a using uh, IRU scheme, but it is quite difficult for us. You can't do that as the government organization. Yeah, no, no, no. As 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 a government organization, yes. So that's why, like more like we do right now, we we develop the new, uh, I mean, uh, entity like the IT Ren is the uh, is the multi stakeholder, not only the government but uh, come from the industry, come the even come from the mostly from the academic. Yeah. But yeah, you see the in academic it, it, we don't have so much money, but we have so much idea and many things. And the other things like the industry, maybe industry have no, let me understand. Your idea then yeah. is fully government, right? No. 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 So okay. That's the problem. Yeah, because uh, uh, maybe ten years ago or fifteen well, years ago. Can you tell us about the formation of ID then? The the formation of ID and currently is uh, uh we built the, like the uh, foundation. Yeah, it's foundation. a foundation. Yeah, something like a foundation among the members. And then uh, we try to uh, discuss with the telco provider, telco company. Yeah, the telco company, they have their own capacity, uh, idle. And then we, we try to look... No, at... let me understand the financial model. So you are a foundation. Yeah, right So now, the foundation is run by... Run the community. Community. Yes. yes. Okay, fine. So how the money is coming to the foundation to run the show? Right now, we will try to, uh, uh, from the, yeah, something like from donation from the, some, maybe government, but it's a small one. Because it should be the government take care of this. Should be. But we know that, yeah, well, maybe, for, uh, maybe at least in the fifth of uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, we cannot uh, guarantee the government money. The charter of the foundation is like that. Government will allocate the budget. It should be. But sometimes when, when we request the budget for something like for the infrastructure, it's difficult. No, that is capital investment. Yeah. I mean the operational expenses. Yeah, Oper operational expenses, OPEX, usually running by the university. And then we... we put uh, some additional charge from for the some university who run for the manage the routing manage the yeah it's the, the different so government doesn't allocate any budget to the foundation for running the operational activities yes, yes. so that's why we we yeah we are like a business entity like we have to, like entrepreneur we have to find the other solution okay so that's why like uh, i you something like i you long term contract for the yeah for link it's uh, it's a uh, very good if we can uh, have this question on the then the sustainability part it is it could be how to see that the sustainability of so then because this is not owned by the government and uh, it is owned by some entity right yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, we maybe in Indonesia we depend on the one university because yeah, of course, government have a budget, but sometimes if uh, the, the policy changes, they, they didn't give us the budget for the oh, this what is different the internet and internet, 
it's quite difficult to to uh, disseminate. No, this is different with the ash. Why? It's different, just uh, IP network. Just, just yeah, that's why I was telling that the connectivity issue is not the main issue for the developing countries or least developed countries. If you tell them that we have the research network connectivity, no one actually will bother. Yeah. You have to address, you have to collect what is their needs. Yes, yes. And you have to address those needs. Their need is not to get the connectivity because they are getting it somehow. Their need lies somewhere else. Okay, I will come to that point later. You can feed just the internet Mm -hmm. Then you're dead. Mm -hmm. It's just the first yeah. time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started at Northern X, we had 100% of our revenue came out of network fees. Mm -hmm. uh, I quickly realized that would be, in the long run, if I didn't add any value in terms of something that was different than I did. So, and the Nordics is a bit different. There was a demand for lamp and so that, that it was a little bit different. But in the end, we were. 60, 65% service. Uh, and that's where my advice is get as close to the day-to-day -day importance. And I think that's also what we've seen from the, the Bellisac project and the Lucy project, that the closer you get to the end user customer, if you're part of the education infrastructure capability, you become a core asset they don't want to let go of. Yeah. I, I've seen from New Zealand and other places, then you get another CIO coming in that used to work for an IP company and they said, oh, why don't we just buy, buy IP of these guys? And that basically made Bayards having severe problems for five years, backing the government about funding. But if you're part of the core services that need to do the teaching and administration on a day-to-day basis, then, then then you are, they are less likely to let go of you. Okay, so, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, services and uh, that's the reason actually Nepal Research and Education Network added uh, telemedicine service as uh, one component of the Research and Education Network as well because we have uh, some members from from the uh, health communities uh, teaching hospitals so we need to engage them with uh, the telemedicine activities as well so we provide technical support to them to link their rural areas right so yeah it's a very important to have the services right i think telemedicine is an area where many emerging should benefit from adding that as a service and that's the reason because if you don't have large research facilities or large research instrument that requires significant amount of bandwidth, the bandwidth argument is hard to justify in that sense, uh, unless you really provide uh, something special that they can't get elsewhere. Uh, if And if you really want to compete on prices uh, with the commercials, that's hard, then you need buying power. Uh, and that's what uh, you've been seeing in ANA and AER. The work that we've been doing there is actually aggregating buying power so that uh, the telco suddenly became interested in dealing with you instead of saying, well, uh, and that's the difference. If you go to telcos, you're either a retail customer or you're a wholesale customer, and the prices are really different. If you if If what you need is at the level of a retail customer, you get retail prices. That was the 300K I talked about before. By going together, we got wholesale prices, carrier prices, which was one sixteenth of what we were supposed, supposed to pay as a as a, a retail customer. So, it, but there you need, uh, there you need uh, mass, and that's why it's good working together. That's how you can get to decrease your prices and be competitive. Uh, if I may add, uh, so what we also did was similar to uh, after visiting Nordnet, we got an idea of how they uh, capitalized on the aggregated uh, economies of scale, basically. So we also similarly to what Nordnet has put in place, 
what we did was we floated a tender to the ISPs. Uh, and we aggregated all the demand of the internet bandwidth required by our all 250 members. And it's about 10 gig connections. And prior to the floating of the tender, the price that the members were paying over was about $15 per Mbps per month for international commercial uh, transit bandwidth. And after we floated the tender, uh, demanding for 10 gig, uh, the price came down from 15 US dollars to six, five US dollars. So more than 100% dip in the price. So, and how we uh, basically reduce the cost, make it more affordable. And uh, so the members were happy with that. Not only for the uh, RNE community, uh, later the regulators also questioned the ISPs. Uh, if why they are not being able to offer what they are offering to us at the same price to all the public to the consumers, so so the, the recently in August uh, last year, uh, the same price that was given to the RNA community uh, was given to general public as well. So as a nation, it we benefited uh, from this strategy. So I think this strategy is something, but we only signed for three years three years contract agreement to supply the uh, uh, international commercial internet bandwidth for all our members, but it is from one source. But we do multi-homing, so we have two ISPs, uh, we connect two, and we put a condition in the tender in such a way that the lowest evaluated bidder uh, price should be matched by the second lowest bidder also. And we gave the uh, uh, L1 lowest bidder 70% of the 10 GPPS and 30% of the 10 GPPS we gave it to the L2. So by ensuring resilient network again. So this is what we achieved in last, I think, uh, two years ago. I, I wanted to mention something. I, by the way, I'm Lorena. Um, I'm from Nokia, leading the research and education network segment together with Thomas. Um, and when Rene mentioned about a telemedicine, I, I, I started thinking about the topics of collaboration that I think is also like some of the, the topics that you wanted to address in, in this panel. Um, and I think it's really important that as a new or emerging brands, you bring that collaboration and partnership in the top of your priorities um, and how you want to develop that strategy. Uh, and we start recently with the incubation of the, the segment. And we understood that the way to start working together with the rents is collaborating. Uh, we can provide the first layer of connectivity, but then what goes on top of that connectivity? What else what we can do uh, with that connectivity? So I think that actually the, the rents tapping into the collaboration that can really harness the more resources, more expertise, uh, sharing different uh, knowledge. And I think the clear example is uh, what we start also uh, doing with Nortonet. Uh, we, we met Eric and with Eric, we start discussing how we can support the emerging rents. What are the kind of like uh, collaborations that we can do with them? Could be consultancy, uh, could be uh, trying to support them in different initiatives that they have. Um, how we can actually expand the knowledge that are happening in the Nordics or in different areas. But um, I think it is really important that you develop what is, is that strategy for what actually you want to collaborate. It could be like internal things that you understand, okay, we want to collaborate because these are our objectives. And for that collaboration, we need this partner ecosystem because you are not going to survive by, by yourself. If you really want to make a long-term um, and sustainable business, you need too many actors to work together. It could be from the government, could be a, from academia, could be like the telecommunication companies, um, or also reading the environment. What are the needs of my country? And my country is focusing in, I don't know, telemedicine or is focusing in agriculture. Based on that, how we can be part of that a, a specific need to don't only provide the, the network infrastructure, what else can we do on top? Um, and for that, maybe I can just bring two examples because Nokia started incubating the digital industry. So we provide telecommunication for our service providers, but also we start developing a telecommunication for segments. With segments, I said, 
uh, mining, um, energy manufacturing, logistics. And we are running that part of the business based in partnership, a strategic alliance. Because we identify that when we go to our potential customers, they don't want the technology. They don't want to talk about, hey, can you bring 5G or IP or optic transport? They, they don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about use cases. What are the solutions that you can enable end to end? So for us, when we go to, I don't know, a, a manufacturing company or a logistic or a warehouse, we don't talk about the technology that we are offering. We are talking about, uh, we can actually enable automated logistics and how we enable that automated logistics through collaboration. And that collaboration comes from like a partner strategy that we start developing. And for the end range, we did the same. We offered the first layer of, of connectivity, but what else we can do on top? So we start developing programs related to um, female empowerment, digital skills, innovating learning spaces, and bridging the digital divide. And for that specific area of innovating learning spaces, we also have a specific example that is um, an innovation center that we help building in Stuttgart. It's the Arena 2036. And that is an, an excellent platform for research and education. And that is when you have all of the actors and elements of collaboration because you have the academia, you have the government, you have the industry partners that are coming from like that ecosystem, you have the, the telecommunication providers, and then the students go there to start doing research in different use cases that they can work together with the industry. So I, as emerging rents, I, I definitely would suggest that you keep that in the top of the priorities. I think right now we can't survive if we don't collaborate. I heard that some of the NRES, they actually have a person that is dealing with, I don't know, international cooperation or this type of strategic alliance. And of course, Nokia also will be happy to, to collaborate going beyond the connectivity layer. And unfortunately, I need to leave today, but Thomas will stay here until Friday. He is the head of evolution and partnership. So he knows a lot about partnership strategies, different models. And I think you will be happy to, to share our expertise and you know the different models that we build for that part of Nokia in the digital industry angle. Okay, if you have any success story, you can share that with us and we will communicate among ourselves. Sure, of and course. We will try to leverage on that. Yeah, we're model. currently working with Red Clara in one of these projects. Red Clara. Yes, so we, and there are like another partners that are kind of like coming together to put a project more in the female empowerment area, but also we are working in, in other areas with them. Um, that we'll be happy to share when that materialize more. Okay, please share the success story with we people and we will try to catch it up. Okay, thank you. So should we move for tea or should we continue? It's up to you. Better to have tea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.